It is my pleasure to introduce a legend tonight. A <laughs> uh, uh, maestro of Italian at Newton North High School who has instilled a lifelong passion for Italian and Italian literature in so many of his students. The life of Italian culture and, uh, and festivities Stop. here at, in Newton. He has organized wine tasting contests of homemade wine. He has organized feste uh, for Carnevale. Uh, he has, um, he currently runs um, a regular film series, a, a Cine group of it, uh, Italian films. He is the co-founder of the Lectura Dante at Boston College. And thus, I am particularly pleased to present Emilio Mazzola, whom you all know. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Laurie. Um, I think sometimes um, these moments can be difficult at best. Thank you very much. The co-founder, by the way, and uh, the motor behind Thank you. behind this this venture is Laurie um, and we shouldn't forget that uh, although she's going to be away next uh, next semester and that will be interesting to see if the the substitutes can can handle the job so welcome to everybody and um, uh, we're going into the, the 15th canto of the Purgatory. Uh, last month, we heard that this is the center, and it is. The next canto really is where things get uh, heated up a little bit as far as the discussion. Um, and tonight, I want to look at, look at this canto simply because all the critics have decided that this is a didactic canto, uh, and once that label goes on it, it uh, goes away, it gets put on the shelf, and they wait for a lettura dante such as this to bring it out of the, the closet, dust it off, and see what we can find. Um, the last month we also heard that this is a canto about love, yes, but more so, it's a canto about reflection. And that will be the, the focus of, of this evening. Reflection is uh, quite important. Um, and for Dante, who I wish I could prepare a lesson the way Dante has prepared this particular lesson. Canto 14, 15, and 16, it's a sequence of events that they are, they are stringed together. You can't really take them apart. And my job tonight is to, to take Canto 15, and hopefully I will not do any damage for Canto 16. Oh, yes, I, I did see him. <laughs> so, Vincent, if I, if I tread on your territory, please. <laughs> but they are. It is a group. And it is important because we are in the center of it all. And this is where Dante is going to tell us a few things about some of his philosophy. <coughs> As a canto of reflection, um, Dante does a, a very good job at setting it up. Uh, I'm going to wait a little bit before I go into the canto and let, talk about a few things that may be already general knowledge, but for the sake of, uh, uh, of those people that may not be aware, here it goes. Uh, in the year 1300, the Jubilee, Purgatorio was accepted as a real place. Um, and prior to, to, uh, to the 1300, in 1215, the Fourth uh, Lateran Council, <coughs> they, um, they establish auricular confession obligatory to all men, adult men and women. Imagine what must have, must have happened at that time. Um, imagine the, 
the machine that the church had to build in order to, to bring this about. You, you, you need an army of people to be able to, to handle this kind of confession. Uh, but not only do you need the number, you need to train these people. They have to know what a venial sin, sin is. They have to be able to differentiate, assign a punishment or uh, whatever the case might have been. There's a great deal of training that has to happen. And the scholastics went to work at this. They created manuals to make sure that people in the field were able to, to handle this kind of, this kind of work. The, and, and the manuals had to be adjusted according to the ability of, uh, uh, of the confessor, uh, the ability of the priest. Uh, you have, uh, as we all know, you have those people that are very capable and those people that are not so capable. So the manuals had to, re had to respond to this kind of need. Uh, very much, very much what's going on now with the uh, education reform here in Massachusetts. Rules upon rules, manuals upon manuals, uh, everything is spelled out. You almost have no room for, for uh, innovation or interpretation. But when you, when, you, when you have a massive movement such as this, you have to have these things in place in order to, to handle the, um, the crowd. Imagine also, I know that I've had these kinds of moments in my professional life when something becomes a rule or I have to respond to it and my first reaction is panic. I'm not prepared to do so. And the same thing happened back then. So Dante here um, is doing a couple of things. Not only one, he's talking to many of the, the confessors and to give them a second hand, to, to help them along uh, the, the learning process. And Dante is a teacher. Um, therefore, every so often, he has to make, he has to use a, a canto in, in this particular manner. Uh, he's speaking, I wish, I wish I could set up a lesson plan the way Dante set up this particular lesson plan. It's quite, it's quite remarkable from my point of view. Um, and I hope you find it the same. Let's, um, let's look for a, main, a moment at the way the, way the, canto, the canto begins. <sighs> the, first, the first six lines is very interested in letting, letting us know what time it is. And he doesn't simply, as Dante always does, he doesn't say it's 6 p.m. He has to go a roundabout way. He has to tease us a little bit. And, quando uh, tal'ultima dell'ora terza, il principio del dì, why is he talking about the third hour in the morning when he really wants to talk to us about the Vespers, the twelfth hour of the day? Um, is there a, a particular reason why he wants to do this? I believe so. If, if, uh, ah, um, please bear with me for a minute. No. Try the next one. More or less Dante's world. Um, this would be the equator. This would be Jerusalem, and rising from the, the southern hemisphere is purgatory. We don't see the part underneath, of course. We only see what comes out of the surface of the water. And here's purgatory. According to Dante's map, Jerusalem and purgatory are the exact opposites. And if it's 3 p.m. Uh, 3 a.m. over here. It's 3 p.m. over here. And if it's 3 p.m. over here, it must be 12 midnight in Italy. Hmm? Uh, if you take the if you take the span of time of uh, of the of the canonical hours, you have vespers beginning at 3 p.m. and ending at 6. 
and if you take the first hour, or the third hour of the day, it, became, it be begins at 6 a.m. and it ends at 9. Why is this important to Dante? Another historical moment uh, is taking place at this time. The canonical hours, according to the, the Christian church, are extremely important for, for prayer and reflection. And what happens at, in the morning in Jerusalem is happening at the same time in, in the evening in purgatory. It's a time of reflection. The laudi is at the, at the beginning of the day and the vespers at the end. It's a time of reflection. You have to think about how you're going to set up your day, what you're going to do for the day, and at the end of the day, you have to review what's happened and take, take account and ownership to, to many respect. At midnight, they're, about, they're, they're getting close to that calling hour, so people are beginning to get up. The people are beginning to move. The clock is not the same as we know it today. Uh, the day ended at 9 p.m. Uh, so six, seven hours later of sleep, they're ready to rise. He's speaking to us all. And most of all, he's speaking to the practitioner, the person that has to go out there and make the day come alive. These people have to reflect about what they're doing. Um, <coughs> then he's established a time of day now. He knows he's... Uh, uh, he's made an attempt at uh, making, you, making us understand where he is. And then he goes into a, a, a little bit of a, a, a game. I'm sure that you've all have uh, had this, the following experience. It's a beautiful fall afternoon, um, or maybe morning, either or. doesn't make any difference. And you may be driving in your car or walking, Okay, so however these things may happen. And all of a sudden you turn the corner and the sun is directly in your eyes. What do you do? You look for cover, right? You hide. You want to make sure you shield this. And now that he's, he has our attention, because he's pointed us exactly where the sun is, and really it doesn't make any difference whether it's, it's uh, uh, the 24th of April or the 24th of uh, October. We're at the opposite end. This is happening right now to us, be it Jerusalem or be it purgatory, we're in the same place. If it's spring here, it must be fall down here. The sun is in the exact same location, looking at us at all times. And um, then he uses a, a, a line that has caused a great deal of um, dissension among the critics. I can't, I'm not a critic, so I, I can't go into the shoes. But uh, Vincenzo Sermonti is probably the one critic that has opened the door and left the door open for us. He simply says, look, I've made an attempt at explaining this, and if anybody else, I don't think I've done a good job, if anybody else has a, a better view Heads off. Come on in and play. So here's my play. The discussion is whether or not spera or sphere really represents the sun or God. In most other places in the Divine Comedy and the Convivio and uh, other writings of Dante, the, the sphere usually refers to the heavens, the God. In this particular case, he's actually talking about the sun, that ball that keeps going around. And this ball seems to play like a child. And I believe in this case that it's not just as, as the sun moves through, through the seasons, but it's really how the sun plays with us at this time of year. It, this doesn't happen any other time. It only happens in the spring and in the fall when the sun is directly in your eye. And when you least expect it, like a playful child, when in his, in his play, the child just does something that offsets our routine. Um, 
If, again, uh, one possible approach, uh, it's open for discussion and open for interpretation because the verdict is not, is not in yet. He has, he has our attention. He knows now that we know how it feels when that sun hits our eyes. And he goes on and he presents, presents the whole situation where he ducks, he uses his hand to shield the light, and, uh, and then towards uh, line 22, Così mi parve da luce rifratta, this is an, an interesting term, reflected. Uh, qui vidi dinanzi a me esser percorso, perché fuggir la mia vista fu ratta. I couldn't see anymore. I was blinded by the light. And it's reflected light. But before he comes to this, he gives us a geometric uh, uh, explanation. Now, uh, I hope there are no mathematicians in the crowd, but he, he's talking about perspective. As the light is reflected by a mirror, it takes the same angle in the opposite direction, and it goes up as much as the, the, light, the ray of light coming down, to the perpendicular line. Well, we also know that uh, Giotto is very much alive and working at this time. I believe Giotto was born in uh, 1267, and he dies in 1332, 37. I don't remember the exact date. Giotto is very much alive, and Giotto is working with that third dimension, that dimension that was lost. There's a great deal of, uh, of dialogue going on back and forth here, I believe. Uh, and, but again, he is using Giotto, I think, for his painting, but Dante did exactly what Giotto would have done with his brush. He did it with his pen. He presented us here with an allegory. We often forget that, or oh, sometimes allegory is one of the, uh, the, the primary focus of this, of this work, but we don't stop and think for a while. He paints a picture for us as Dante and Virgil come around the bend of the, of the purgatory going westward and the sun hits him in the eye and he says, you are aware of what's going on. He shields his eye with his hand and in a way shies away from the light. This is exactly the allegory that he's going to explain to us in the, few, in the coming verses. He set up the picture. We can see it. Now, again, back to the manual. Sometime a painting is enough for, for interpretation. And the person that's capable to do it will take the, will take the painting and, and read it, interpret it. But some people need the point by point approach. So after he's done with the allegory, he tells us exactly what he's talking about. Uh, and as we go through the canto, you will see that it's this light that blinds us and Dante is not ready to receive it. What is this light that he's not ready to receive? He shies aw shy shines away from the light. <coughs> um, he needs to ask Virgil, uh, first of all, the light is so powerful. This light is, it's not as powerful as the sunlight that we just experienced as we turned the corner. This light is overtaking. And it looks like it's rushing at him. And he's afraid. He has to look away. As a matter of fact, as he says, que uh, perché a fuggir la mia vista fu rata. I couldn't see anymore. I was blinded by the light. He needs to ask Virgil about what happened. What is this that's coming along? And Virgil uh, simply says, don't be so marveled. Um, there will come a time when uh, um, the family of, of heaven 
and Sir Monty says in today's term it would be the uh, the serving uh, uh, we can't call them servants anymore so it would be the uh, domestic collaborators of heaven <laughs> and <laughs> <coughs> There will come a time, not too long from now, where you will, be, you will be able to handle this. And line 33, quanto natura sentir ti dispose. And this kind of set me up a little bit. Is it possible that we're born with a, a finite quantity of appreciation? Is it possible that only the few have so much and only and many don't have enough to be able to accept this light. Um, again, this is a, a moment where interpretation is quite, uh, quite open for us. And as he reaches, because it's not the angel that's coming towards them, it's the light that's ru rushing, the light reflected by the angel that's rushing towards them. Uh, they're moving towards the angel. And when they get to the angel, um, the angel is very accepting. He, 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 under, he understands that Dante is laboring with some, with some issue. Um, he doesn't put him on the spot and say, wait a minute, you haven't quite understood what's going on here, so you can't move up to the next, to the next level. He simply says, uh, intrate quinci. Not a problem. Go ahead. Uh, this is also extremely important as we see, as we reach towards the end of the canto. Um, and as they are entering, as this, the, the pea is healed, washed away, um, they're entering the, the staircase that happens to be one less erect, meaning there's one less step to climb they hear a song. No, they're not with us. Um, Beati misericordias. Um, the Matthew 5, um, the Sermon on the Mount, the blessed are those, and there's a whole list of, among which is Beati misericordias. This is a, this is a key moment. He moves on. And now, now we're going to find out what it is that made, that made Dante shy away from the light that was rushing towards him. Again, you have to be ready. Um, I, I shouldn't run ahead of myself. Um, both of them climbing along. Dante figures this is a good time because there's a period of lull here. They have to climb to the next level. This is a good time to ask Virgil some, some, some information, get, get his thoughts on some things. Again, here we go. Uh, Dante, is, uh, Dante the Pilgrim, eh? Uh, I apologize if I didn't make that distinction. We're talking about Dante the Pilgrim, us, the common folk, who are traveling with him. Uh, and we don't know the things that Dante the author knows. So Dante the Pilgrim says, what, what was it that he said? You remember in Canto, um, in Canto 14, line 86 and 87, O gente umana, perché poni il core la the mestier di consorzio di vieto. Oh, human sorts. Why is it that you always end up going into that area where the few are privileged? <coughs> he, he didn't understand this back then. And it's interesting also the way Sir Monte tackles this particular problem in this. Uh, in his passage, he says, uh, uh, if you recall back in Canto 14, we didn't understand it either. <laughs> so we have a, a, a few places where explanations are needed, not only for Dante, but also for the experts. They're quite uh, obscure. 
So Virgil attempts to, to clear Dante's thought, so Dante's uh, question. And uh, first he tells him, of course, not to worry about uh, the gentleman back there who was uh, expiating his pain. And he should do that because that way it will help the whole, uh, the whole environment. It will help the, the growing process. Um, and then he says, Perché s'appunto è nei vostri disire dove per compagnia parte si scema? Because you, you humans are always focused on dividing among the few the goods. Your, your size, the bellows of your size are never calm. You're always looking for more. But if you were to turn your sights to the eternal love, that one up there, you will find that you won't have this kind of problem. Allow yourself to move away from material goods. Dante still doesn't understand. And in thinking about this process, trying to figure out what it could be, there is an anecdote that I would like to, to bring to the, the reading tonight. A colleague, for the sake of argument, let's call the colleague Dante. Um, I was standing with Dante one day on, at school, and one other colleague came out with a machine on a cart. As soon as she came out, Dante said, I want one of those. And I responded, why? I mean, the lady is legally blind. That's a magnifying machine. What would you need it for? Oh, I thought that if she could have it, why couldn't I? I didn't think about this for a while. I, I thought about it reading, trying to come up with an answer for these things. That venial sin, most likely Dante, had, if Dante had received that machine, and later figure out that the machine was not useful, would Dante have given it back? Or would Dante put it in the closet and say, you never know, I may need it one day. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that I think he's trying to tell us. That maybe we have to differentiate. Clearly, Dante wasn't going to hurt anybody by, by ordering a machine. It would have been a waste of money. Dante wouldn't have been able to use the machine. And it would have died in the closet somewhere. And 20 years from now, somebody would have dug it up. It's exactly this kind of things that, that they're talking about. It's not planned. It's spontaneous. It's that envy for some, that those bellows that are constantly pumping away at us, they keep us from resting. Got to have it, only because she has it, not because it may be useful. The lesson here is extremely important. And this is, yes, uh, it doesn't have, uh, even Sermonti says, it doesn't have real poetic uh, uh, endeavor, especially in the early part of the canto, because it's dismissed as a, a didactic canto. But we need to learn this particular, this particular piece. The priests that are going to be sitting, listening to, to confession, have to be able to distinguish between these kinds of sins. <clears throat> you can't simply dismiss it. But again, this, this, this takes training. And Dante is playing along with the, with the scholastics here in establishing um, a ground on which everybody can tread. Um, here, Virgil gets a little bit upset with Dante, a little sarcastic, uh, in line 64. Però che tu rifichi la mente pur alle cose terrene, di vera luce tenebre di spicchi. You shine of dark light, Dante. You know, simply because you can't separate yourself from those material goods. There's no need for you to have that machine. 
get over it. It's OK. It's OK if someone else has it and you don't. But this is a real, a real problem. He hasn't, quite, he hasn't quite appreciated all of this. And then, of course, this is the, the love aspect. Um, we know that Dante has talked about love endlessly. Um, we know he's talked about uh, physical love as well as spiritual love. He's moving away, slowly moving away. And now that infinito e ineffabile bene. Um, I asked my colleagues because I couldn't figure out how to translate bene. To me, it was simply good. But it's not good enough to be just good. So the word for tonight is beneficence. I guess it, I think it, it answers the question a little better than simply good. That eternal beneficence that doesn't have any, any hooks to, to his love. Uh, again, for the sake of arguing, we'll make God a he. Um, he doesn't have any hooks. He gives without expecting anything back. Uh, and this is sometimes something very difficult for us to understand. Uh, this also is preparing, is preparing the audience for Canto 16, where he's going to talk about <coughs> freedom of choice. And once again, I apologize if I preempt uh, Vincent, but um, Okay. From De Monarchia, Dante says, because he, he's talking about freedom of choice, Io dico invece che il giudizio è il termine medio fra l'apprendere uh, e l'appetire. Judgment is the, the mediator between learning and desire, acquiring and desire. Oh, appetite, uh, uh, hunger. Prima infatti una cosa è appresa. First, something is learned. Dopo è giudicata buona o cattiva. And then it's judged good or bad. E infin colui che giudica la segue o la sfugge. And he who finally judges it either follows it or runs away from it. Se dunque il giudizio è nuovo in tutto l'appetito, if, on the other hand, uh, judgment moves in all the appetite, ed in nessun modo è da quello prevenuto, and it's not uh, stimulated by that appetite, um, he's free. If, on the other hand, Judgment is moved by appetite. I'm trying to translate as I go, so I apologize. Uh, well, see, see, in, in, that in some way, any which way, influences on his decision, he cannot be free because he doesn't depend on himself, but he's absorbed by other. I think, I think he did a wonderful job in trying to express what free, freedom of choice is. And this is what Dante the Pilgrim is having a difficult time understanding. Because after, after Virgil explains to him um, about love and the everlasting love of God. He says, I, should have, I shouldn't have said anything. I'm hungrier now than I was before. Going on, I apologize. I went back a couple of steps. This is a, a, a passage that I'm still having a difficult time understanding. I think I have it. Dante, uh, Virgil, 
Virgil says, um, that infinite beneficence that's up there runs to love like light goes to a shining object. And the more, the more it gives itself more when it finds ardore, it finds that power, that fire. Um, for extending charity, you grow the value of love. I think I have it. I think I understand. And therefore, the more, the more charity, the more, the more souls in the, in the chiostro up in, the, in heavens can talk about love, the more love there is to go around, it grows exponentially. And a, like a mirror to another mirror, the light is reflected. So it, you have to imagine a room full of, uh, full of mirrors this, and this ray of light reflecting off each mirror, bouncing off and creating this wonderful light show. Uh, we have machines to do that these days. Uh, I don't know that Dante anticipated laser <coughs> shows, but, but we are, we're there. So love can only exist through the practice of love. And it can't be, I'm sorry, because the word reciprocal may confuse the issue a little bit. It has to be love without a return. The Chinese proverb, I'm sure you all have heard it, for every favor you receive, you must perform 10 favors in return, but not to the person that gave out the first favor. You must spread that love all around. So don't do something expecting to have something in return. And this is the crux. This is where he can't get over. And many of us can't get over this. Uh, clearly, the anecdote, I think, illustrates that quite well. Um, and then, of course, he says, if my, if my reasoning doesn't appease you, then don't worry about it. In a while, you'll be with Beatrice, and she'll tell you everything you want to know. She will quench your thirst. Dante, all excited about this moment, uh, he wants to tell him that he really understood. I'm there. I've arrived. I understand what you're talking about. And he's hit by a vision. Now, the second, this is the end of the second part. Um, Dante pretty much evenly divides the canto into four sections. Uh, the first one, as we've seen, was the presentation, the allegorical presentation. The second one is the explanation of the, of, of the, uh, of the allegory. And now he moves into the next level. And this is not unusual for Dante. To, uh, you remember back in, uh, back in Inferno, up until about uh, seventh uh, canto or so, one canto, one level, one canto, one level. And then all of a sudden, he got crazy on us. He says, if you want to follow, you're going to have to be able to do, you, may, you have to be able to multitask. <coughs> He's moving into the second, into the, the next level, where <coughs> anger is going to be, um, is going to be treated. <coughs> Like most uh, in Purgatorio, every, every new level begins with visions, or at least uh, representations of, uh, uh, of the sin that's being expiated in the level. And it's usually uh, from, uh, uh, from the classical world and uh, uh, the biblical world. Uh, in this particular sequence, we have uh, three visions. Uh, one from the classical world and two from uh, uh, the New Testament. The, um, as he begins this climb, now uh, before I go, 
we can see why the angel wasn't preoccupied. As a matter of fact, he said to him, God, he took a vinci. The angel already knew that he was going to overcome this issue. And in the next canto, the, the, the discussion is going to intensify around free will. So notice how he slowly but surely brings us along in order to make sure that we understand and we, and we, can, we can follow his thinking. And uh, one side comment, I think, I think this canto could use a little bit of uh, recognition from the critics. But um, too scholarly, maybe, or too, too pointed to the classroom, or maybe too pointed to home life. Uh, clearly, it's very pointed to uh, the clergy that has to handle this. Uh, these people have to understand the process. They have to understand what sins are all about. They have to be able to comfort. Um, and like, because uh, the priesthood is very much like a school, you need the manuals. Uh, Dante provided the manual for, for this particular show. Okay, he moves on to the next, to the next level. And the first one to, to take his, his mind away is Mary, the Madonna, mother of Jesus. And you probably all know the event. Uh, Jesus has disappeared for a few days. They're looking every day frantically. I know what my reaction would have been. But what we see is a calm mother who looks at the child and says, why? Don't you know the pain you caused us? Without, without a sign of anger. I don't know that I'm, I would be capable of doing this. I really don't. But, you know, sometimes these are moments. Uh, and and when, we, when we appreciate these moments, maybe there is a little bit of a, a function going on here. There's a, there's a moment that, of realization. Maybe I have to be calmer. Maybe I have to be more understanding. Clearly, Jesus wasn't doing anything wrong, right? He was busy talking with the, with the doctors of religion. That's a good thing. He should have said something. Maybe had he had a cell phone, he might have behaved differently. That's what everybody tells me. Mr. Mitchell doesn't have a cell phone. <laughs> um, the, second, the second one is from... Uh, the classical world, Athens, Pisistrato. And Pisistrato's wife is angry because a young man has dared to embrace or kiss their daughter. And shouldn't you, Pisistrato, the king, do something about, about this offense? Who dares to kiss the king's daughter without permission? And here, too, we have a moment a calm moment where Pisistrato simply says, not to worry, it's okay. Uh, besides, if we punish those that love us, what will we do to the people that hate us? Nice, nice comeback, I think. Um, thirdly, um, he meets up with uh, St. Stephen's. And St. Stephen's is being uh, uh, stoned to death, um, and here's this young man that's on the verge of dying, and instead of being angry with the people that are, that are prosecuting him, he looks up in the sky and asks God to forgive, uh, to forgive the, uh, the murderers or the executioners. Uh, Jesus-like situation, you recall Jesus on the, on the cross, but three moments that do something to, to Dante's, um, something happens here, um, and I lost the place, uh, uh, 112, 113, yeah, further down, ah, the last line, one, uh, 118. Io riconobbi i miei non falsi errori. Uh, what did he recognize? 
uh, clearly an error is an error, but in this case it's not the false errors. What did he know? What did he realize? Is it in retrospect? Does it have to do with envy? Or does it have to do with anger? Um, again, it's open, it's open for discussion. I believe, I believe that in this case the two are combined. Just like greed, envy, and anger are a unit. They seem to go in that, in that manner. First comes greed, then comes envy, and then comes anger. And all of this is playing on the non-reflective mirror or shining of dark light. The mirror will give us a light, a clear one, and it will bounce off as long as the mirror is clean. If the mirror is dirty, the light is going to be absorbed more than reflected. Uh, if, if we need, if we need a, a, a practical example of this, just think of your windshield. We all drive. If the windshield is not clean, the sun rays are a difficult thing to handle when we drive. Same, same thing here. The three are not at all separate. Um, uh, there's a, there's a question of symmetry, and uh, I, I forgot the name of, uh, uh, of the scholar who's looking back at Inferno and trying to figure out if there were three levels there uh, in Inferno, and there's only two, actually, because we go through greed um, and, and uh, uh, prodigality, and then we go into into anger, so that that third one, that envy, but in Inferno we're dealing with mortal sins. These are these are these are sins that will never bring you away. Here in Purgatorio, the definition has to be much clearer. Um, we know that uh, in in the eighth canto, I believe uh, Dante is grappling with this issue uh, of, of greed and. As he moves up into Purgatorio, envy has to be has to be identified, has to be separated because of the three steps. Um, somebody might want to go back to the first three steps of Purgatory. There's a correlation there, but it's a little bit too much of a reach. Uh, although it could work, uh, one can make an argument for that. Um, so. He has, to, he has to overcome this group of, of sins in order to move on. And uh, it's a gradual movement. It can't be done all at once. Therefore, the angel at the gate says, remember that uh, the merciful are, are blessed and go on because you will win. You will conquer this. So maybe, maybe these three illustrations, these three uh, daydreams, because he's still awake, um, could, could be a reason why he's learned something. <coughs> the last part of, of the canto uh, starts with Lo duca mio che mi potea veder far si come om che dal sonno si lega disse <laughs> What's the matter with you? What's going on? You look like uh, you look like you came out of your sleep here you, for for a half a mile here. You've only you, your your legs have been uh, haven't been with you. You look like someone that's uh, <coughs> that has come out of a sleep or or has had a few too many to drink. And he's so so enthused by what he saw that he can't wait to tell him. Oh, dolce padre. Again, here, yeah, the terminology is important. Uh, this is the father-child relationship. Is it the father-child relationship, or is it the individual father-child relationship? It's open. Anyone can work, and that is the beauty. Um, I would love to 
tell you what, what just happened to me. And Virgil shuts him down. Says, you don't have to. Even if you wear a hundred masks, you can't keep your sentiments from me. I know exactly what you're thinking about. So Virgil knows what's going on. Virgil, has Virgil seen the same things that Dante has seen? It really doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that Virgil can always tell what's in, her, in Dante's heart. That's been happening from the very first canto we've known, we've known this. Uh, he can read his mind. So why doesn't he help him along? Why doesn't he give him the carrot? Because it's not enough to give someone a carrot. Dante has to get there on his own. He has to go through the process of understanding what's going on. And the only way he can do it is to experience it. So they move on. Um, and they, um, they turn. The light is still in his eyes. Um, this time he doesn't seem to be shying away from the light now. Clearly it's not the light from the angel. It's not reflected from the angel. Now he's actually looking at the sun because it's sunset, the sun is still in his eye. Maybe the light is not so powerful coming from, his, from the sun now. Or maybe, maybe he's cleansed the, himself a little bit. Maybe he is, he is moving forward and the light can be absorbed and hopefully be reflected by him. Um, and then, of course, they're enveloped by, by smoke. Um, and again, the two opposites. And, and he does this all the time. Uh, Jerusalem and, and purgatory, uh, loud in vespers, bright light, and questo ne tolse gli occhi e l'aereo puro. The smoke took our vision away. So he, he opens with uh, the blinding light and closes with, uh, with absence of light. Interesting, interesting move. Um, I am going to try very hard at trying to, trying to bring about a lesson plan in this manner. It may take a month to, to do it all, but I like the way he set up the canto, almost evenly divided. I think uh, uh, I did count them. I have it all written down, but that's OK. It's really not important. The, the explanation of love and, and envy is the one that takes uh, one, I believe, two terzine more than the rest of them. But otherwise, it's evenly, evenly divided. Uh, as if he has a clock on his hand and he's paying attention to the, to the timeline. And he says, okay, that's time. We've got to move on to step B now. Again, the manual, the manual is here. Uh, I forgot to tell you about another, uh, um, the line, uh, uh, 70, 75. E come specchio l'uno all'altro rende. This one, too, has given, has given the scholars a great deal of work. They haven't quite been able to, to pinpoint the meaning here. Why is he doing this? Um, I think I have the notes from, uh, from Sermonti. Um, by the way, I, I've used Sermonti um, because he seems to be the most um, the most up-to-date, especially with cantos that don't have as much, um, as much poetic style, as much power as some of the other cantos have. Uh, I've, I've tried to look for criticism on, on this canto, and it's, it's narrow. Uh, even the uh, Encyclopedia Dantesca reports some of these impasses, these crux that, uh, that they haven't been able to overcome. Uh, no, I didn't, I didn't write it down. Um, well, it, it's not important. But uh, in, 
in the Encyclopedia Dantesca we have the same issue. The canto is problematic because of a few, a few images and the use of a few words that don't quite jive with, uh, with Dante's um, uh, normal behavior. Okay, we'll uh, move on to the, to the reading. <coughs> oh, non è importante a questo momento, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Quanto, uh, before I begin, I apologize to have, uh, having stapled these uh, upside down. Uh, there, is, there is a sequence, when you turn the page, you have to look at the bottom and then move up to the top. Very much like what's happening. Although I didn't plan it, I didn't plan it. So happened that it worked this way. Sometimes. Okay. Quanto tra l'ultimar dell'ora terza e il principio del di par della sfera che sempre a guisa di fanciullo scherza, tanto pareva già in ver la sera essere al sol del suo corso rimaso. Vespro là e qui mezzanotte era. E i raggi ne ferian per mezzo il naso, perché per noi girato era sì il monte, che già dritti andavamo in verlo caso. Quando io senti a me gravar la fronte e lo splendore assai più che di prima, e stupor m'eran le cose non conte. Ond'io levai le mani in ver la cima della mia ciglia, e fecimi il solecchio che del soverchio visibile lima. Come quando dell'acqua o dello specchio salta l'oraggio all'apposita parte, salendo su per lo mondo parecchio, a quel che scende, uh, ho sbagliato, uh, lo modo parecchio a quel che scende e tanto si diparte dal cader della pietra in igual tratta, siccome mostra esperienza e arte. Così mi parve, da luce rifratta, qui vi dinanzi a me esser percorso, perché a fuggir la mia vista fu ratta. Che è quel, dolce padre? A che non posso schermar lo viso tanto che mi vaglia, dissi io, e parer in ver noi essere mosso? Non ti meravigliar se ancor t'abbaglia la famiglia del cielo, a me rispose. Messo è che viene ad invitar con saglia. Tosto sarà che a veder queste cose non ti fia grave, ma fiati di letto quanto natura a sentirti dispuose. Poi giunti fummo all'angel benedetto, con lieta voce disse, entrate quinci. Ad un scaleo vi è, mie, vi è meno che gli altri eretto. Noi montavam già partiti di linci e beati mesi di Gordies fu cantato retro. E godi che tu vinci. Lo mio maestro e io soli ambedue suso andavamo e io pensai andando prode a quest'ar nelle parole sue e drizzami a lui si dimandando. Che volse dir lo spirito di Romagna e di vieto e consorte menzionando? Perché lì a me di suo maggior magagna conosce il danno e però non s'ammiri se ne riprende perché men si piagna. Perché s'appuntano i vostri disiri dove per compagnia parte si scema invidia muove il manta coi sospiri. Ma se l'amor della spera suprema torcesse in suso il desiderio vostro, non vi sarebbe al petto quella tema, che per quanti si dice più lì nostro, tanto possiede più di ben ciascuno, e più di caretate arde in quel chiostro. Io son d'esser contento più digiuno, dissi io, che se mi fossi, fosse pria, pria taciuto, e più di dubbio nella mente ad uno, come esser puote con ben distribuito in più posseditor faccia più ricchi di sé che se da pochi è posseduto? Ed egli a me. Però che tu rificchi la mente pur alle cose terrene, di vera luce tenebra di spicchi. Quello infinito e ineffabil bene che lassù è, così corre ad amore come al lucido corpo raggio vene. Tanto si dà quanto trova d'ardore, sicché, quantunque carità si stende, 
cresce sovra essa l'eterno valore. E quanta gente più lassù si intende, più v'è da bene amare e più vi sama, e come specchio l'uno all'altro rende. E se la mia ragion non ti disfama, vedrai Beatrice, ed ella pienamente ti torrà questa e ciascun'altra brama. Procaccia pur che tosto siano spente, come son già le due, le cinque piaghe che si richiudono per esser dolente. Come io voleva dicir, tu m'appaghe, vidimi giunso, giunto in sull'altro girone, sì che tacer mi fe le luci vaghe. Ivi mi parve in una visione estatica di subide essere tratto e vedere in un tempio pu più persone e una donna in sull'entrare sull con atto dolce di madre dicer figlio al mio perché hai tu così verso noi fatto? Ecco, dolenti, lo, padre, lo tuo padre e io ti cercavamo e come qui si tacque Ciò che parea prima dispario. Indi m'apparve un'altra, con quell'acqua giù per le gote che il dolor distilla quando di gran dispetto in altrui nacque, e dir, se tu sei sire della villa, del cui nome nei dei fu tanta lite, e onde ogni scienza disfavilla, vendica di te, di quelle braccia ardite che abbracciar nostra figlia, o oh, pisistrato! E il Signor mi parea benigno e mite, risponder lei con viso temperato. Che farem noi a chi mal ne disira, se quel che ci ama è per noi condannato? Poi vidi genti accese in fuoco d'ira, con pietre un giovinetto accidir, forte gridando a sé pur, martira, martira! E lui vedea chinarsi per la morte che l'aggravava già in ver la terra, ma degli occhi faceva sempre al ciel porte, orando all'alto sire, in tanta guerra, che perdonasse ai suoi persecutori con quello aspetto che pietà di serra. Quando l'anima mia tornò di fuori alle cose che son fuor di lei vere, io riconobbi i miei non falsi errori. Lo duca mia, eh, lo duca mio, che mi potea veder far sì com'om che dal sonno si slega, disse, che hai che non ti puoi tenere, ma sei venuto più che mezza lega, velendo gli occhi e con le gambe a volte, a guisa di cui vino o sonno piega? O oh, dolce padre, se tu m'ascolte, io ti dirò, dissi io, ciò che m'apparve quando le gambe mi furono si tolte, ed ei, se tu avessi cento larve sopra la faccia, non mi sarian chiuse le tue cogitazioni, quantunque parve. Ciò che vedesti fu perché non scuse d'aprir lo cor all'acque della pace che dall'eterno fonte son diffuse. Non dimandai che hai, per quel che face chi guarda pur con l'occhio che non vede, quando disanimato il corpo giace, ma dimandai per dati forza al piede. Così frugar convienzi i pigri, lenti ad usar lor vigilia quando riede. Noi andavamo per lo vespro, attenti oltre quando potean gli occhi allungarsi contro i raggi serotini e lucenti. Ed ecco, a poco a poco, un fumo farsi verso di noi come la notte oscuro. Né da quello era loco da cansarsi. Questo ne tolse gli occhi e l'aere puro. Grazie. <laughs> if, if you have any questions, any ideas, any comments, uh, this is the time. Just yes. Mm. Right, but the opposite. Again, why would you call an error false? Well, exactly. That's what I'm going to be on. But it's the same thing. Why would you start talking about what time it is if it's the evening? Why would you start talking about the, the sun had enough, enough <coughs> to go 
like the morning sun in the evening. And he, he does this quite a bit in this canto. Um, was there a reason to, to, for his rhyme scheme? Or was it to instill us that, that point? An error is an error. And you can't call an error false. Because it is by nature. By nature. Yeah. By definition. Right. That is, you, uh, it's a play on words, right? An error is an error. It can't be a non-false error. Can it? It can't. It's a real error. It's a real error. Right? Real, just real error. That's how we should interpret it. Right. Well, there's, there's a couple of crux here in yeah. the soul canto that are, are difficult to overcome. And any, anybody else? No? Right, so the error was real. I think, I mean, it, it, but again, I think it's this play of the opposites. He's playing with us, I think. Uh, sometimes, sometimes something is not real until it's real, and maybe this this is what he's trying to, to bring across. Finally, he realized something that maybe, maybe he had been uh, putting it away, you know, hiding it in the closet or under the carpet. Um, and, and now he has to confront it. Right. And it seems like he's distinguishing between the psychological um, impact and the verity. Maybe. Yeah, it clearly, clearly he's been having a difficult time with all of this all along, right? And the whole thing is about shying away, uh, not accepting, not accepting the truth not accepting the advice. Um, he tells Virgil that he's hungrier now than before he asked the question. Well, actually, I wanted to ask you about that, because it strikes me as really strong that insisting, usually Dante, you know, the pilgrim picks up on stuff really quickly and doesn't use his mind of information. And it just seems funny at this point that he keeps on pushing and saying, and I'm, I'm wondering if it could be interpreted as, I mean, because we know Dante, the writer, wasn't, like, envy isn't his In a way, it's almost like he becomes envious of this knowledge. Like, he really, really wants this knowledge. He's hungry for it. And this is a way for him to participate in the sin somehow. Interesting. Um, because this is going to lead up to the next canto, where freedom of choice is ironed out, it's discussed. And, it, and he, has to, he, has to set, he has to set the stage. So. The doubting Thomas here is important. The one that doesn't get it the first time around. The one that has to be made to go through the process in order to, to really acquire, he's appreciate. He's really interested in the process in this whole concept. Yes. And yeah. he will be in the next one because he talks about the habitus, learning yeah. how to control the will. Yeah. Isn't he also somewhat consumed by his problem with sort of anger? He got angry a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think he was, I mean, who knows, but 
But could it be that he was trying to deal, trying to come to, to grips with his own problems in that regard? He yes. Be angry with because it happens. It happens after the visions, yeah. right? Yeah. So he he's gone through he's gone through greed, and he's gone through envy. Envy gave him a little problem because he quite didn't didn't quite understand that uh, when the many participate, everybody feels richer. He wants to divvy up among the few, uh, which is, I mean, this could be a, an argument for communism, but, um, but then again, God is communist, no? He gives equally to all. It's how much we take that makes a difference. Um, and then he, he learned something at the end of the three visions, the vision of mercy, which is the opposite of anger. Love is the opposite of envy, and mercy is the opposite of anger. Um, I think he, he did a fantastic job here. And I never appreciate, like, like these lesser canto, if we can call them lesser cantos, you never really, really get into them until it's, it's your job to do something with them. And all of a sudden, you find things that you overlooked before. Maybe because time wasn't available, or maybe because we, we follow the sad script, right? These are the, the important cantos. Well, what about these others? Well, they're not so important. You can skip them. And we do, because once again, we're all trying to feed ourselves. It's, it's a way to reach, uh, to reach the end uh, as fast as we can, and overlooking some of the things could be, that could be very important. Um, again, that anecdote I told you, it had escaped me until I read this canto. I just dismissed it. And now that becomes a hallmark for me because it's not easy to understand what envy is. We often think about, we often think about material goods and in large quantities, but we don't often think about these moments that are forever present in our daily routine. When somebody wants something, not because of need or necessity, but because someone else has it. And that, that hit a home run for me. Anyways, the jury is still out on this canto. So you can, you can definitely participate and uh, make the interpretation. I, I must tell you that the, the, first, the first 39 lines really got me. Uh, trying to, why is he spending so much time at painting this picture? Clearly is responding to Giotto. Huh? Giotto is very much alive and working and, he, and he's rediscovering the third dimension. And the third dimension is all about perspective. And he did it here with, uh, with the angle. Now, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's off. But I don't think he's off by that much. And me, he may be off at the reflection. Uh, how far will it go? Will it go as far as the, the, the light? Will it reach the same height as the light or the source of the ray? It needs, a lot, it needs many mirrors in order to, to go back to that, to that original point. And the many mirrors are here. Um, not only here, but they're up in heaven. And the more love is practiced, the more, the more light is produced. The more light is reflected. The more mirrors are available. Yes? Did you take this canto to the school? No. No, because it's not, it's not a canto that will grab you and say, whoa, something is really happening here. But um, I'm, I, I am having second thoughts, only because we're in that business, uh, writing lesson plans. It's hiding of so many important points in the comedy in paradise. It's, a, you know, it's really essential. It is. And all of this is going to be, it's not going away. Yeah. It's not going away. If anything, it's going to be. Um, multiplied, maybe exponentially, as we, as we move up. 
Um, this light isn't going to go away. Um, the, the issue of the sphere, well, uh, we, we've accepted that the sphere represents God. In this particular opening, he's not talking about God. Though. He's talking about, and I think it's the playful child that inadvertently <coughs> shines a light in your eye or trips you as you're moving by. You're not prepared for it. But it comes back straight on 52. Yes. Easy weekend. Oh, yes. Well, in that case, the sphera is God. Yeah. There's no, no question there. But at the beginning, and um, often the, the argument is made that it's the movement of the sun uh, through, through the day. Uh, some people have, uh, have talked about uh, the playfulness of the, su of the sun because it hides. Yes, when does it hide? Behind the cloud, behind the tree, or uh, at night? But I don't think it's the sun hiding. I think it's really that unexpected moment when you turn the corner and you're hit by the, the sun ray and you can't do anything. Accidents have, have, have been known to have happened at that particular moment. Mo, well, thank you for your attention. And, uh, See you next month.